Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to MedSynapse podcast series, your go-to podcast for all things medical. I'm your host, Dr. Nigar, and today we have the honor of hosting Dr. Ibrahim Jalaydan, a distinguished authority in the field of adult cardiology, specializing in advanced heart failure, adult transplant, and echocardiography. Dr. Ibrahim Jalaydan not only serves as a consultant at the prestigious King Faisal Cardiac Center in King Abdulaziz Medical City, but also holds key roles as the Echocardiography Fellowship Program Director and Chairman of the Advanced Heart Failure and Cardiac Transplant Management Committee. Let's delve into the realms of heart failure as we explore the diagnostics, medications, lifestyle, devices, education, and surgical interventions with our esteemed guest, Dr. Ibrahim Jalaydan. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Nijar, and uh, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity and the chance to speak at your uh, podcast. And hopefully, um, our dear colleague from physician, people in the healthcare industry will find this uh, podcast helpful and useful for managing such an important disease uh, with a high burden in our healthcare system in the Gulf area uh, and the Middle Eastern area, uh, such as heart failure. Dr. Ibrahim, thank you so much for joining us on our MedSynapse podcast. It's an honor to have you on this platform on this very important topic. The pleasure is mine. Now let's dive right in into our discussion. Dr. Ibrahim, to begin with, how do you diagnose and assess the risk of heart failure in patients? Okay, Dr. Nijar, excellent question. So. Uh, first of all, a few words about how common is this in our region and also in the world. So heart failure uh, prevalence is around 1-2% to 2 worldwide. Uh, we don't have uh, strong data in our region, but uh, for example, in Saudi Arabia, given that estimation, we're anticipating that around 500 to 600,000 uh, persons living with heart failure in our country, in Saudi Arabia, for example as a country of this region. Uh, so it's a huge problem that face our uh, community. And there's a lot of risk factors that we have to identify as a physician or people working in the healthcare industry. Uh, for example, aging population. So it's uh, heart failure will be more common in our aging population. Other common risk factors is, is like coronary artery disease, which is uh, very common also in our area, especially with the high prevalence of diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, which all contribute to the uh, uh, to the coronary artery disease burden. So um, those are a significant risk factor. Obviously, um, the risk of uh, tobacco abuse, um, uh, uh, substance abuse, uh, people who are exposed to strong medications such as chemotherapy, uh, all those are risk factor to develop heart failure. Uh, we have to distinguish between risk factors and uh, causes of heart failure. So there, there, is, there um, is some overlap between the two. Um, so etiologies for heart failure, most commonly is coronary artery disease. So obviously when we diagnose patient with heart failure, we have to rule out etiologies that are very common such as coronary artery disease. So our investigation or our, our um, diagnostic setup tools, we have to use it for a couple of a couple of uh, approaches, if I can put it this way. We need to identify the, the etiology of the disease, and then we need also to identify which stage of the disease we are in. So uh, let's start with some of the tests or the basic tests that we're using, and that will give us an idea on some of the reason that, or the etiologies of heart failure. So uh, basically, if the patient come to your clinic or to a family physician clinic, internal medicine, or even a general cardiologist with uh, heart failure symptoms, such as uh, dyspnea or shortness of breath on exertion, uh, orthopnea or PND, which is difficulty breathing, lying uh, flat, uh, or waking up from sleep because of lack of, um, of air, uh, uh, swelling of the body, so lower limb edema, ascites, or any, any uh, collection of fluid, uh, or fatigue or tiredness with exertion, or chest pain even with exertion, all those can give you a hint uh, that this patient may suffer from heart failure. So those patients, we have to establish a diagnosis first. So there are few blood tests and workup that we need to 
do for all those patients. Uh, I will refer all the physicians to the uh, American uh, Heart Association guideline or the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. They both are excellent in terms of the setup of workup that we do for the patient, but we definitely start up with the ECG, basic blood works, and uh, a cardiac enzyme called BMP or NT Pro BMP that could lead us to the diagnosis of heart failure. And obviously the echocardiogram, which is a very crucial test in this situation because it will give us uh, a clue into the diagnosis and also to help us with the etiology of this in most of the time. So those are the basic investigation and with those investigation, we need to understand um, the etiology of heart failure if we can. So we need sometimes to ask for more tests like coronary angiogram or cardiac MRI because etiology for heart failure or causes that can cause heart failure are uh, wide variety of reasons. It could be coronary artery disease, could be um, significant valvular heart disease, uncontrolled hypertension, uh, metabolic disorders, infiltrative disorders, some genetic factors. So family history is important as well. So there's a lot of reasons and those are the basic tests that we need to order. So basic tests, as we mentioned, blood works, ECG and echocardiography to identify the etiology and also to know the extent of the disease and assess the function of the heart and divide the heart failure into different etiology because all of those, all of that will help us with the uh, management plan for a heart failure patient. Thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim, for shedding light on this important process of diagnosis and assessing heart failure risks in patients. Now let's shift our focus to the next aspect, exploring the latest medications and factors guiding prescription decisions. What are the latest medications for heart failure and how do you decide which ones to prescribe? Okay, excellent question, Dr. Nijar. And we've been lucky in the heart failure field because uh, there uh, were a lot of advancement over the last few years. We used to use only a couple of medication or three medication for a long period of time, but now we have um, a multiple trials showing multiple classes of medication that uh, showed significant benefit for our population and increased the prosperity of our patients. So in the next few minutes, I'll probably shed a light into that. So the first important step is to identify which type of heart failure a patient is experiencing. So there is commonly we, we have uh, what we call heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So when we do an echocardiogram, we look at the ejection fraction or how much you're ejecting basically blood from your heart with each beat and the normal is around uh, uh, 55 or or more there's few differences between male and female but that's the usual normal so if your patient come with symptoms or sign of heart failure we have to do an echocardiogram not just only to identify the etiology but also to know the ejection fraction because that will help us with the treatment plan so if the ejection fraction is less than 40 those patients we call heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and we need to treat them with multiple medications so the medications are one is called RASI inhibition or renin angiotensin system uh, blocking uh, medications like uh, uh, a medication called Entresto which is one of the newer medication or valsartan sacubitril combination another medication uh, class another, another alternative medication in that class is ACE inhibitors such as um, lisinopril, prendopril, or ARB, or angiotensin receptor blocker, like valsartan and candesartan. So this is a group of medication called RAS inhibition medication. So this is a cornerstone of HEFREF therapy or heart failure with a dose ejection fraction. The second, so we have four cornerstones. That's the first one. The second one is beta blocker. Not all beta blockers are studied in heart failure, but mainly bisoprolol, carvedilol, and long-acting metoprolol. The third group of medication are called mineralocorticoid antagonists, such as spironolactone and epinone. And the fourth newer medication that we're using for this group of patients is SGLT2 inhibitor. It's a diabetic medication originally, but now showed significant uh, results in heart failure patients. And now it's a cornerstone of heart failure patient treatment, regardless of their diabetic status, such as dapagliflozin and impagliflozin. So those are the four pillars of heart failure therapy with, with reduced ejection fraction. And we need to make sure as a practitioner that our HFREF patients are on those four medications unless there is a great contraindication. And if we cannot start those therapy, we should refer the patient for a specialist because of the great benefit for those medications. 
If we look at the other parts, so patients who are having heart failure symptoms, but their ejection fraction is more than 40%, 40 to 50 called mild reduced ejection fraction, or 50 and above, so heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, we don't have the same luxury of choices, but now recently the SGL2 to inhibitor or dapagliflozin, impagliflozin showed significant benefit on those group of patients. So now we use those group of medication across ejection fraction. There is some benefit in some of the patients for the interestral. Uh, some of the patients may benefit from spironolactone or beta blockers. So we have to be a little bit selective in the population with the ejection fraction above 40%. Another thing also is we need to identify comorbidities. So patients who, for example, have coronary artery disease, we need to discuss revascularization if feasible or if beneficial. People who do have significant valvular disease to be fixed. Uh, people who do have an abnormal or uncontrolled arrhythmias to be treated. People with iron deficiency anemia, for example, will get a great benefit if they give IV iron in heart failure patient people with atrial fibrillation. So there's a lot of comorbidities come with heart failure patient that we need to look at as well. Uh, so it's not only the medical therapy part, but the medical therapy, prolonged life, it have significant improvement of patient survival. So we need to make sure that all of our patients using those therapies and ask for help from our heart failure colleagues or cardiologists who are treating heart failure patient to add extra therapy if those patients are not tolerating the first line, as we mentioned, or still having symptoms and heart failure hospitalization with the current therapy. So this is for the medical therapy in summary. Thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim, for shedding light on the latest medications for heart failure and the considerations behind prescribing them. It is truly evident that staying informed about these advancements is very vital for providing the optimal care to patients. Now, moving forward, we would like to explore your expertise in advising heart failure patients on diet and exercise. Okay, excellent question, Dr. Nijar. And this is a very crucial question because this is part of the uh, treatment plan that we don't usually pay attention to as a physician, unfortunately, uh, but it can help the patient significantly. So we do have what we call non-pharmacological option for treatment uh, for patients with heart failure. First of all, in terms of the diet, uh, we do have evidence for the Mediterranean diet. So basically, um, the, what we call the DASH diet. So diet that's are high in vegetables and high in fibers and high in healthy fat, low in carbo complex carbohydrates and low in sugar. So this is a, a good diet that we advise everyone, not just heart failure patients. We do have some evidence that Salt restriction can help patients with heart failure in terms of their symptoms. Uh, so restricting the sodium content to less than two grams per day. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to calculate this for heart failure patients. So we can use the expertise of our colleague from the, from the dietitians to sit with the patient and guide them in how to calculate the salt content. I know it's difficult for, the, for, for our heart failure patient to, to do that, but it will help some patients in terms of their symptoms. In terms of the fluid restriction, we don't usually tend to do a lot of restriction for all patients. It's mainly for patients who are struggling with a fluid retention. And we say usually roughly around two liter a day is a good, um, a good uh, number that we can, um, we can use. That's for the diet part. In terms of exercise, so we go with the usual um, HA or the American Heart uh, so it's American Heart Association uh, guideline for exercise in general with minimal uh, 150 minutes of exercise per week of usually we like we can divide it into our patient into maybe uh, 30 to 40 minutes daily for five days a week um, or sometimes an elderly patient who cannot do this amount of exercise we can say a group of 10 minutes or five minutes during the day so any kind of exercise will help our heart failure patient and it's the same advice for every actually patient who is suffering from cardiac disease. We do advise to involve some resistant exercise to increase the muscle mass because a lot of the, uh, or loss of muscle mass is one of the bad prognostic signs of heart failure patient. Obviously, there is also other non-stuff that's not medication-wise like vaccines. For, so influenza vaccine is very important for heart failure patient, actually save life. Uh, and uh, now we are in the season for, for influenza vaccine. So, um, um, 
please ask your family doctor or your uh, healthcare provider in your region to get the vaccines. Uh, and eventually non-medical management include heart failure team. So every hospital should invest into creating a heart failure team, multidisciplinary team, because also that should improve mortality for heart failure patient, as well as uh, decrease hospitalization and improve the hospital uh, resources so we can use it in somewhere else. So those are a very important non-medication uh, intervention that we can use for our heart failure patients. It is evident that lifestyle interventions play a significant role in managing this condition and your insights have provided valuable guidance on optimizing the patient outcomes. Now let's move our focus to another crucial area that is the use of implantable devices like pacemakers and defibrillation in heart failure management. Dr. Ibrahim, when do you recommend implantable devices in heart failure management? Excellent question. So uh, a key part of this is always start with the medical therapy first. So before we refer patient for device therapy, and that's a common mistake that we usually see, uh, most of the patient we need to, there is few exceptions, but most of the patients we need to uh, give appropriate medical therapy or revascularization, for example, if there is a coronary artery disease, before we decide to send the patient for device therapy. And usually we say um, a th three months of optimal medical therapy and revascularization before we consider device therapy. There is few exceptions, as I mentioned, if patient come in for a secondary prevention, for example, so patients survive the cardiac arrest or um, having high risk feature in MRI or, or in Holter. So those are few exceptions that I don't think we have the time to delve into. But the major majority of the patient will require medical therapy first, correct the underlying cause, optimize it, and then reassess the situation in three months. A key factor is try to push your medical therapy as much as possible. So there is multiple trials now showing benefit from escalating the therapy in the first six weeks of management. So we need to reach to high doses, frequent monitoring, and then reassess the patient ejection fraction. So the key as always is the ejection fraction. I know maybe it's not the best in terms of estimating the risk, but it's the tool that we are commonly using right now. So if the ejection fraction is less than 30% or 35%, so I say, like we say usually if it's less than 30%, regardless of the patient's symptoms, or if it's less than 35% with NYHA class two or three symptoms. So the patient is a bit symptomatic. So to make it easier, if your patient ejection fraction is less than 35, then you have to consider it. Maybe if the patient is completely asymptomatic, you, you can get away without it, but that's the, the, the magical number. So think about 35%. So then we should think about first ICD which is the defibrillator device. So this device is basically get you out of, get your patient out of abnormal rhythm, VT or VF and save their lives. So that's the first device that we think about. But also before considering this, this device, we should do an ECG for the patient because if the patient ECG showed sign of desynchronization, so a left bundle branch block, wide QRS complex, uh, the, the perfect number we're looking for is more than 150 uh, in the QRS complex. And uh, then we should consider not just the ICD, but also a third wire. So the device now is called CRTD. So resynchronization re therapy plus a defibrillator. So it's a device with one generator, but three leads. The idea is we need to uh, synchronize and make the LV and the RV contract together instead of the RV first and the LV in case of lit bundle branch block. So in summary, optimize your medical therapy first, reassess your ejection fraction. If it's less than 35% with symptoms or less than 30 without symptoms, then you should consider the defibrillator device alone if the QRS is narrow. But if your QRS complex is wide with sign of desynchrony, then you should add a resynchronization therapy to the defibrillator. So this part usually is um, in the hand of the electrophysiologist. So once as a cardiologist or internal medicine managing heart failure patient reach that stage, referring the patient at this stage to the electrophysiologist will be uh, a good uh, choice. As I mentioned as well, there are people who we do the device before, such as high risk patient, uh, but that's usually not the common um, uh, rule. That's the exception. Now, moving on to our next question, 
Dr. Ibrahim, how do you educate the patients about their condition, medications, and recognizing the worsening of their symptoms? Excellent question. So this is a crucial part, and that's why we always advocate for multidisciplinary team in managing heart failure patient. So heart failure physician or a cardiologist or an internist alone cannot do the job. We, we use a team. So for example, in a hospital, there is a heart failure a nurse practitioner who help us with the education part. And there is always other part of the team members, such as the nurses on the floor, clinical pharmacist, um, uh, ed patient education. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, team that can work with the patient. And the most important part is to educate the patient either while they're in the hospital, for example, if they're admitted with acute decompensate heart failure, that's a good chance to increase the awareness of the disease and the compliance to the medication or in the clinic. So uh, that's a very crucial part of the patient management. Also, we need to educate the patient family because heart failure is a chronic disease and it's a progressive disease. So family are a really important key factor in treating heart failure because they can help the patient with the diet, with the exercise, with the arranging the medication, especially elderly population or people who do have some health literacy. So this is very crucial. And then we should inv involve the patient with the symptoms are recognizing the high risk feature symptoms. So we always advise the patient to, for example, weigh themselves daily in the morning to, to notice any trend or change in their weight, to uh, examine their feet, like the diabetic patient, for example, to look for any signs of swelling, monitor the symptoms, basically the difficulty breathing, if it's increasing or not, monitoring their blood pressure and vital sign at home if they can, because all of that will help us managing or catching the patient who are going to show signs of advanced heart failure early enough and we can treat them and prevent further deterioration uh, uh, from happening. Now, coming to our final question of the day, what are the criteria for surgical interventions like heart transplantation or ventricular assist devices in advanced heart failure cases? Excellent question. And it's a very crucial one. And the reason is because uh, the reason is those patients uh, usually drift into advanced heart failure without recognition. And once they are being recognized by an advanced heart failure cardiologist in an advanced heart failure center, they are too late for such a major intervention like transplant or mechanical assist device. So it's crucial always for the cardiologist, heart failure cardiologist, or even internists who are managing heart failure patient to identify those patients early. Uh, and there, is, uh, there are multiple risk factors that we should uh, pay attention to. There is multiple mnemonic or multiple criteria that is the guideline, but let's uh, take only the, the most important uh, uh, ones that we should pay attention to. So if your patient requires multiple hospitalizations, so heart failure patient, we know that the ho multiple hospitalization increase their mortality. So if you face a patient who are coming to the hospital more than one time, that's a sign that this patient is developing uh, probably advanced heart failure and need more or careful attention and need deferral for a high care center. Another sign is if that your patient is not tolerating medical therapy, especially the neurohormonal therapy such as rise inhibition, mineral corticoid, beta blocker. So if you notice that your patient is having a lot of side effects from the medication, you have to pull out the medication because of hypertension, uh, kidney dysfunction, a lot of other side effects. This is also another sign of advanced heart failure. Also, the symptoms of, of the patient. If they're developing significant dyspnea or shortness of breath with the usual activity around the house that affect their daily living, that means they are in YJ three to four or in another, um, there is multiple uh, uh, criteria that we assess patient for. Some of them call the intermac profile. Basically, we need to understand that patient symptoms really matter. So if the patients are symptomatic despite good therapy, despite overcoming all the reversible factors, then those patients need to be uh, addressed uh, with careful attention. Obviously, the decision of transplant uh, or mechanical assist device should be done in an advanced heart failure center because there is a lot of uh, tests that need to be done to assist the patient's suitability, make sure that the patient have enough social support, there's no issues with compliance because of how 
resource uh, intense those intervention can be so but so the key is to identify those patients that can benefit from such a referral early uh, and not too late obviously also <clears throat> transplant is uh, is is uh, a very uh, a difficult procedure and the tra- donation uh, is a key uh, limiting factor so i advise people who are living uh, like i advise all the healthcare practitioner to educate your patient about organ donation um, um, for example in uae there is the hayat uh, program in saudi there is donation program in token application there is a lot of different resources in depending on your region so you have to look at those resources and try to educate the patient about this to increase the donor pool and help us giving those uh, treatment to the patient uh, that they deserve so um please identify your patient early with the signs that i um uh, i summarized in the last few minutes thank you so much dr ibrahim for sharing your invaluable expertise and insights into the multifaceted management of heart failure your depth of knowledge across diagnostics medications the device therapies and surgical interventions has been truly enlightening on our platform. We appreciate your dedication to advancing the field of cardiology and improving patient outcomes. Thank you so much, Dr. Ibrahim. No, thank you very much, Dr. Nijar, for shedding and giving the opportunity to shed the light on this uh, disease. And hopefully we can have uh, an impact on, on those patients uh, to be better, uh, hopefully, and to survive uh, this uh, chronic disease. Definitely, Doctor. We're looking forward to having many more insightful topics and discussions on our platform together. Inshallah, I'm happy to do more uh, if needed. Thank you so much once again. And to our audience, thank you for joining us on this episode of MedSynapse. We hope you found today's discussion informative and engaging. Stay tuned for more enlightening conversations with leading experts in the medical field. Until next time, stay healthy and well-informed. Goodbye.